uh, enough people are here, we can probably get uh, started. Uh, so, uh, by the way, I've, I've rec I'm recording these lectures, uh, which I think will be useful if people maybe miss a lecture or, or something like this. Um, but I'm not sure the best way to distribute these lectures. So, uh, because if I put them on, say, Brightspace, well, this is very secure, but then only people who are actually enrolled in the course would have access to them. Uh, put, it on, put, put it on Twitter. On Twitter, yeah, I, I think it's too many words for Twitter. <laughs> um, I, I do have a Twitter account, though, uh, but I, I've never posted on Twitter. I should, when, when Twitter first started, I, I got a Twitter account just because it looked like it was becoming a big deal. So I wanted to get Jesse Peterson. So, so I, I got, uh, I'm, I'm at Jesse Peterson, but I've, but I've never actually used my Twitter account. Uh, yeah, but I, so I could put it on YouTube, uh, for instance, that would, that would be fine. Uh, but then I, I would want to make sure that everybody who was, uh, I guess if you're not enrolled in the course, you don't get a say, but if somebody is enrolled in the course, I guess there's, they have a right to privacy. So anybody who's enrolled in the course and maybe doesn't want it on YouTube, uh, you, can, you can let me know if that's the case. Uh, otherwise- It depends, if I, if I ask a really stupid question, uh, then, then I might w not waive my, my right. Yeah, for instance, so. <laughs> So, so that, that's why I would want to give people who are enrolled in the course the, the option if they, if they don't want to cons consent to have it on YouTube. Um, Wait, why can't you just put it in your website or something? Uh, well, because again, if, if any, so the issue is any way that I make it publicly available, there's probably a privacy issue. And I right. Can you just can can't you just put a like a password or something to the? Oh, you to think I'm page? I'm that technologically savvy <laughs> that I could rig that up on my web page <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> but uh i mean i i'm i'm fine making it publicly available but i you know the the vanderbilt policy is that uh if a student in the course objects then uh then we can't make it publicly available uh so if any if any students enrolled in the class uh, do not want the recordings to make it publicly available please send me an email or 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 let me know or something um if that's if that's the case then that's fine i'll, I'll just figure out some other way to make it uh, a private uh, i mean i probably i could also do it on youtube somehow with with private and then i have a password to it or something like that um, all right uh so anyway here's the syllabus um there's not really much to talk about in the syllabus uh, but i suppose i should show you the syllabus so that you know there is one it can be downloaded from the course web page uh, as far as grades go uh, you know maybe i'll give homework at some point um, in the past when i've given these topics courses uh, i get less and less motivated to assign homework as the semester goes on so um uh, you know, but just as long as if you're enrolled in the course and, and you need a grade as, as there's no reason that you won't get an A unless you like stop coming to lectures or, or if you stop uh, participating somehow. Um, so, so this is a topics course. At this point in your graduate career, uh, you should be self-motivated to, to study stuff. So I shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't need grades as a, as a motivation. All right, uh, yeah, so there's really nothing to talk about on the syllabus. Uh, for the topics in the course, uh, they're listed on the syllabus, but uh, I've come up with a bit more detailed schedule uh, on the web page. So this is the course web page. Uh, so I, if you look through it, you can see it's, I, I think it's pretty ambitious. So we'll see how much of this we'll actually be able to get through. Uh, of all the topics, that only leaves me with four lectures left over, not assigned. So uh, I think it's quite possible that, you know, as the semester goes on, we might have to cut some of these uh, topics that I've currently listed here as what I would like to get through for the course. Uh, but if you want to know what to expect, you can look at the course webpage, and I have references. 
and uh, and also then you can um, uh, prepare for the lecture by looking at that section in, in the book, or at least you can have the book available with you uh, if you you know if I move on and you you need to see some definitions or something. Uh, although I probably so you you can also see like we'll go through quite a bit of Brown and Ozawa. Um, uh, but we jump around, so like uh, this week we'll do chapter section 2.6 and then next week we'll do 12.1. So we're going to jump around quite a bit and then I'll adjust uh, as we go um, so that you guys have all the preliminaries uh, necessary. So this course, uh, so I think it will be fairly fast paced. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's on the more advanced side. Uh, so we'll start with even just defining amenable groups already today, so that should be the foundation. Uh, if you're looking for something a bit less advanced or, or something like that in addition to this, I think Dennis Osen is also giving a course this semester on group theory, uh, which I think kind of like the ending point that he's hoping to get to, I think he's, he's doing property T and amenability and stuff like this. Uh, so that would be kind of the ending point that he would get to. Uh, let's see, yeah, so any questions about the syllabus or the schedule? I have a small remark, um, this is the mm -hmm. first time, this is the first time I have a physical copy of, of the textbook that for, for a course I'm taking. So. Ah, good job, Sri. <laughs> so, just because you already had the book? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's good to know. Uh, all right. So, uh, any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll dive right in. All right. Great. And uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, here we go. So I'm, I'm always used to, to giving chalkboard talks. So this is my, the best imitation of a chalkboard I could come up with. Um, oh, one, one little question. So are you yes. going to, are you going to provide us with notes or? Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, so since I'm giving, so since I plan my lecture so that each lecture corresponds to a section in a book or, or paper. Uh, so because of that, I may not want to do all the extra work to write out notes. Um, uh, so what about uh, these notes, like you're writing on the, on your iPad? Are you gonna oh yes, these, the, the, the notes that I take during lectures, I, I will make those available on the course with okay. yeah. yeah, that's no problem. But as far as like typing up actual notes, uh, I think I probably won't do that just uh, because it takes a lot of time. And since we have uh, textbooks and we're going through sections which correspond to those uh, sections, for the most part, right, right. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to give separate notes. Although I might give separate notes at some points if we do something that's significantly different so, or, or at the end, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, my plan that I hope to get to is that by the end, we'll, do, we'll be right caught up to current research in the field and then uh, maybe I'll provide some notes uh, uh, for that. <clears throat> but that'll be near the end of the semester. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so let's go ahead and begin. Uh, so the place I think to begin this course is, is really going back to the work of Lebeg. There'll be some history in this first lecture. Uh, so this is Lebeg in uh, 1902. And that is when he uh, introduced Lebesgue measure. Um, and this is which, a fun fact, Lebesgue measure was actually his uh, PhD defense. So this is Lebesgue's PhD defense, which puts a lot of pressure on all the graduate students uh, in the course. So this is what you have to as your starting point. Uh, Lebeg in 1902, his PhD defense, which was, uh, he basically answered the question, you know, how do we measure 
uh, subsets of Rn. Uh, so this was the question he was looking at uh, specifically how, you know, they had like Riemann integration at this point, uh, but how can you extend these notions to more complicated sets? <clears throat> and so he came up with his theory of Lebesgue measure and then uh, Lebesgue integration. And these two things, Lebesgue measure and integration, uh, comprised his PhD uh, thesis. Uh, and basically the main theorem he proved is that uh, you could greatly um, expand the notion of what sets you could measure. Uh, so he came up with what is now, so the solution for this was uh, what is now called Lebesgue measure. So just he developed Lebesgue measure. Uh, so this was the starting point. And then, of course, uh, this completely revolutionized uh, everything. Um, and, you know, the fact that you could come up with such a general theory that Lebesgue came up with. And, uh, and so naturally, one of the questions was, well, Lebesgue had this condition on, on what sets could be measurable. And then the, the natural question was, uh, could every set be measurable? And the answer to this was no. In fact, Vitaly, and this was a, uh, four years later, or th three years later, in 1905, uh, he, he showed that there exists uh, non-measurable sets. So there exist sets. Um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with about Vitaly sets and, and we'll maybe give a quick proof of, of Vitaly's theorem in just a moment. Uh, but then this, this creates a problem. Uh, so Lebesgue had this idea of maybe possibly measuring every possible set. Uh, so the question is, is you know, uh, what Vitaly actually showed is that you can't extend Lebesgue measure to accountably additive function on, on every subset. And, uh, and so then the, the, the two possibilities of how you solve this sort of thing is uh, one, you could then uh, still insist on countably additivity, but restrict your, the, the allowable sets to be measured. So, um, so this is the problem that Vitaly created, and then the possible solutions are uh, one, you could still insist on countably additive measures, and then restrict the sets that can be measured. Or the other possibility is you can weaken the notion of measure to finitely additive, allow finitely additive measures. But then, uh, but then try to generalize to all possible sets, uh, try to measure. And both of these directions led to quite a bit of research, uh, which I'll maybe briefly discuss. Uh, in the first case, there was, um, uh, general theory developed. Actually, the most of the work was done on the second case before the case. This was really a question at the time in 1905 is, you know, what should, what we should we consider to be a good notion of a measure? And there were many people who thought finitely additive should be just as fine as countably additive. Of course, as history progressed, we, we found that the, the first solution tends to be the one 
that's applied to more situations. So the first solution tends to be the one you would learn, say, in a first year of graduate analysis course. Um, but at the time, it was very unclear. And, and originally, after Vitaly's uh, introduced this notion of a non-measurable set, most of the research went into the second uh, problem to try to find finitely additive measures to extend the notion of, of measurable set. But let me start with the first condition, uh, because that maybe, in some respects, maybe was more successful ultimately in, in terms of wider applications. And, and in this case, uh, there was a general theory that developed. Oh, but I, I should mention, of course, Lebeg's work. Uh, he was interested in measuring. Uh, subsets of, of the real of the reals or the RN but of course what considered a good measure for him so I, I've mentioned countably additive or, or finally additive but also what was crucial is that it be invariant under rigid rotations uh, it'd be invariant under under um, rigid transformations of RN uh, so really what Lebec did is not so much as you know a uh, a problem in geometry or something, but it was more a problem in group theory, where you have this group acting on Rn, the group of rigid transformations, and you want to find this notion that uh, Lebesgue measure is invariant under these transformations. And that's what a general theory developed for in the work of Haar. Uh, so Haar, and this was in 1933, uh, he showed that uh, every locally compact group G has a left uh, invariant uh, regular measure uh, such that uh, compact sets Now, finite measure and open sets have positive measure. And if you consider Rn acting on itself by just translation, this is exactly Lebesgue measure. So, Har kind of generalized Lebesgue's theorem to general locally compact groups. And, uh, and even more generally, uh, so Har showed existence and then it was von Neumann. I think I wrote the date down for this. This was the following year, 1934. Uh, he showed that Har measure was unique up to a constant multiple. And this is a useful result because uh, it then allows you to introduce the modular function and you can talk about unimodular you know, groups and, and, uh, and that. And in particular, this, this notion has been generalized that uh, now you know, a useful fact, which I'll mention without proof, is that in general, this can be done even for homogeneous spaces. So if you have H, a closed subgroup of G, So then the homogeneous space G mod H, well, G naturally acts on this by left multiplication. And this has a unique measure class um, uh, which is G invariant. By that, I mean that it may not have a G invariant measure in general, but it at least has a measure class, meaning that they have the same null sets. Uh, so this always has a unique measure class. Moreover, this class contains an invariant measure 
if and only if uh, the modular function of G, when you restrict it to H, you get the modular function of H. Uh, so for instance, if G is unimodular, then you also want that H is unimodular. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a very nice and concise statement and, and you get a whole nice theory out of this, this direction, uh, which has led to lots of research. Um, uh, now let's see, how am I doing on time? We started at three. Okay, so I think I have time. Let me go ahead and prove to you Vitaly's uh, theorem since it's a nice warm up. And it kind of has a lot of what we're gonna discuss in the seminar will be about measures or existence of measures, existence of states, uh, uh, et cetera. So that's why I think this is a good place to start. So let me uh, give you a proof of Vitaly's theorem that I promised you. Uh, so again, this is from 1905. Uh, although let me make it a bit more general, I'll, I'll show you that this works even for any locally compact group. Uh, so G locally compact. Uh, so then there does not exist an extension of Haar measure Um, uh, which is countably additive G invariant uh, and defined on all sets. All right, so let's give a proof of this fact. Uh, so the idea of Vitaly was exactly to come up with some sort of equivalence for the countable equivalence relation on the group, and then to pick one, uh, one element from each measure class. So this, this uh, he did for the reals, and this works for any locally compact group. Uh, you could just take, let's let K and G. Professor? Yes. I'm a little confused. What happens with natural numbers with counting measure? Oh, yes, thank you. I forgot one important hypothesis, and that is that this is non-discrete. Thank you. Of course, if it's a discrete group, then counting measure would uh, is, is certainly defined on, on all sets. So that's, uh, so non-discrete is, is essential. Thank you. I just forgot to add that on. All right, so now let's prove this. Uh, so let's K be a compact uh, subset of G with positive measures. Be a compact subset with positive measure. So if you're used to recalling the proof with the reals, this you might take, say, the interval 0, 1. Uh, so then what you do here is, is the next thing you need is you need a um, countable subgroup, a countably infinite subgroup. So let's let, uh, say, lambda and G be uh, a group generated as a group by a countable uh, subset of k times k inverse. So we just take a countable, countably infinite, I should say, by countably infinite subset of k times k inverse. Uh, so of course, here's where I use non-discreteness because if, uh, if G is discrete, then K is finite, and so there does not exist an infinite subset of K times K inverse. But as soon as G is non-discrete, uh, we're taking a compact subset with positive measure, so it has to, be an un uh, has, has to be an infinite set. You can't have finite uh, sets with positive measure unless the group is discrete. All right, uh, so then we define 
an equivalence relation on the group G by the orbits of lambda. So two elements of G are equivalent if and only if uh, you can get from one to the other by multiplying on the left by an element of lambda. And then what we can do is we can let V for Vitali uh, be uh, any set, it'll be contained in K. V a subset of K be any set uh, that uh, intersects uh, in exactly one element uh, for each equivalence class Uh, so I guess I want K to be a subset of K, and as I've defined it so far, it's not clear that uh, every orbit intersects K, so we'll assume that. So for each equivalence class, that intersects K. All right, so since an, uh, each, if you have an equivalence class that intersects K, then of course there's an element of K in that equivalence class, and so axiom of choice, you can choose such a subset. Uh, and then the thing to notice is, of course, uh, that if you have lambda and lambda, so then, or lambda one and lambda two and lambda, so then lambda one v is a disjoint, is disjoint from lambda two v, unless they're equal. Uh, what this means in particular is that if you have some K and K, uh, so then uh, we have K and K, so in particular the whole orbit intersects K. And so by definition of V, there's some element of the orbit of K that, that lives in V. So there exists some T and lambda such that T V are uh, uh, there exists some, excuse me, some T and lambda such that TK is in V. That's the definition of V. Uh, but therefore, uh, we want to analyze this T a little bit more. We have that uh, T is equal uh, to TK times K inverse. And TK is in V, which is, of course, part of K. And K inverse is in K inverse. So this element T, whatever it is, we get a bit more information about it. This is in K times K inverse, which is a compact set. Uh, so every element in K is some translate of another element in V by something in this compact set. So what does this mean? Well, we have the, therefore we have this inclusion, K is contained in lambda intersect K times K inverse times V, that's what we just showed. And of course this is contained in the first sets contained in K times K inverse and the second set V is contained in K. So we've sandwiched this uh, disjoint union of translates of V, countably infinite disjoint union of of translates of V in between these two compact sets. So that's the key idea of vitality. Uh, so therefore, if we could extend Haar measure, we can check what would the measure of this set lambda intersect K times K inverse be. Well, again, this is, as I mentioned, this is a disjoint union. So this is then just the sum over all T and lambda intersect K times K inverse of lambda T V. And we're assuming that this extension is left invariant. So this is the same as the sum over T lambda intersect K K inverse of lambda V. Now we have a countably infinite sum of something so therefore it's either zero if that's something zero or it's infinite if that's something's non-infinite. 
but on the other hand, we've sandwiched this set between two sets, one of the first of which has positive measure. So, but lambda k, this is greater than zero by hypothesis, and this is less, so therefore this is less than or equal to lambda of this set. which is then less than or equal to lambda of k times k inverse times k, which is a compact set, and so it has finite measure. Uh, so that gives a contradiction. Uh, so that's how Vitaly's proof goes. Of course, Vitaly's proof was exactly the case k at the unit interval, and, uh, and lambda, in this case, lambda the rationals if g is the reals. But everything Excuse goes me. through just as fine. Right. Why, is, why is lambda of k, um, why is that greater than or equal to zero? Did I miss something? That uh, why is lambda of k greater than zero? A greater than zero specifically, yes. Uh, that was the very first thing we took is we took a compact set with positive measure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, so that then, yeah, gives a contradiction. Okay, so, so a couple things about this is one is we see that this proof of Vitaly uh, works in great generality, but the other we see the key notion here is this kind of you can decompose a set into a countable union of, of equivalent sets. And this is, uh, a theme that we'll see over and over again with this sort of decomposition. So now let me go back to what I was talking about before, mainly these two dichotomies. So I just talked about the first dichotomy. We had this general generalization of Haar measure. Uh, now let me talk about the second uh, way to extend this notion. And that is by allowing all sets, but by restricting what we mean by a measure, meaning we can allow finitely additive measures. So this is for finitely additive measures. So, and then the first kind of uh, series of breakthroughs here, uh, well, maybe the first big breakthrough was Hausdorff in 1914. And then a little bit after that, we have this theorem of Banach. in 1923, so a little bit less than 100 years ago, uh, which is the following is that uh, both, so on both the reals and on R2, there do exist uh, um, uh, finitely additive extensions of Lebesgue measure uh, that are invariant under rigid under rigid motions. Uh, so this is the, this is maybe one of the reasons why this direction maybe got a little bit more attention at first is because there was some success, uh, which is that for the reals or R2, uh, you actually can measure every single set uh, in a way which is translation invariant. Uh, and you just have to allow yourself finally additive. So this proof of Vitaly, you know, it really did we use countably additive at a very key point. Uh, and if you try to do it with finally additive, it would not work. That's what Bonnock proved. Nonetheless, here's where uh, the very interesting thing came into play. Nonetheless, we have another theorem of, of Bonnock and Tarski from a few years later, 1926. And this builds off the work of Hausdorff that I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, which is 1914. 
I won't always have the dates of all the theorems, but I thought for the first lecture, it'll be a bit more of a history lesson, so I would write down the dates. Uh, it's kind of fun to see when this, when this stuff happened. Uh, so this is the famous Bonak-Tarski paradox, where they showed that if d is greater than or equal to three, then uh, rd does not have a finitely additive extension of Lebesgue measure. Uh, that is invariant under rigid motions. So it doesn't exist. And this is this famous uh, Bonak-Tarski paradox where they can take the, the sphere in R3 um, the uniball in R3, and they can de decompose it into finitely many sets, and then rearrange these finitely many sets with rigid motions to come up with two copies of the uniball in R3. Uh, and that proves, of course, that this doesn't exist. Uh, and then the kind of next big breakthrough after this was a few years later when von Neumann uh, realized that what Bonak and Bonak Tarski did here, and what Hausdorff kind of hinted at earlier, uh, was that there was a very good reason. So, when you first see this result, you you think, you know, there's quite this is quite striking that you see something, you know, for the reals and even R two, and then it's completely different in R three. And uh, and von Neumann was the one, the first person to really pinpoint what was the exact difference between these cases. And that's when he introduced this uh, definition, which is a key definition and will be a theme throughout the course. So this is due to von Neumann in 1929. And that is, he said, so here we have gamma, a group. Uh, by the way, I'll try to use maybe Greek letters like gamma to denote discrete groups, so groups with a discrete topology. And for locally compact groups more generally, I'll, I'll try to use letters like G and H, but I don't know how consistent I'll be on this. Um, but let G be a group, uh, X a set, and suppose G acts on this set by transformations. Uh, this action is amenable. So I should clarify, of course, there are now at least three different notions of amenable for actions on various sets. So maybe I'll write in the sense of von Neumann. We'll see other notions of amenable later and for actions later in the semester. One where X is a topological space and the other when X is a measure space. Uh, but for just a set, we'll say that the action is amenable if there exists a uh, gamma invariant uh, finite, finitely additive Uh, probability measure. On X. So by this I mean that it's uh, finally additive on on disjoint subsets. It's a measure, meaning that it takes you know non-negative values, and uh, and of course it increases for larger sets or non-decreasing for larger sets. And probability just means that it gives weight the whole space measure one. So that's what I mean by probability. So this is a notion that von Neumann introduced. And a particular nice action is when the group acts on itself. I left translation. So gamma is amenable if the action of gamma on itself uh, by left translation
is amenable. I have one question. Yes. We also put the probability measure condition because otherwise counting measure would do the trick for. Uh, correct. So if we allowed any, any measure, then we could even take counting measure, which is sigma additive. Absolutely. Uh, so this is a non-trivial condition. We'll, we'll see that there are some groups which have this and some groups which don't. Um, absolutely. All right. In fact, that was what von Neumann noticed, is that the difference between these two theorems of Banach uh, and banach tarski is that, uh, is that the groups um, RD cross OD, so the groups of rigid motions of the plane, uh, this is amenable if and only if uh, D is equal to one or two. And if D is three or higher, then this is non-amenable. And this was exactly the key distinction between the why you why there did exist measures on one, but there didn't exist on the other. Uh, okay. So we'll actually prove uh, Pretty easily, we will be able to see that this is amenable for D1 and 2, and then you can prove Banach's theorem probably by the end of next, next lecture. Uh, for Banach Tarski, you also have to prove that it's non amenable for D equals 3, then it's also non amenable for higher, which amounts to embedding a free group into O3. Uh, but I'm not going to do that just to save time in the lectures, but you can look that up if you haven't seen that up before. Um, okay, and then there's a bit more massaging you have to do. For the Banach-Tarski paradox. All right, but I will make a few remarks, and that is that uh, finite additivity. Um, at first glance, it might look like you know you have you know maybe you're all used to measure theory, you're used to integration, but you've always studied this countably additive. And now here I'm throwing in finally additive thing. Well, the nice thing is is that there's actually a connection between the two which allows you to use the techniques you've already learned from say measure theory or functional analysis to deal with finitely additive functions. And that is, uh, is that if you have a measure, a finitely additive measure on a set, then you can integrate functions on that set, bounded functions on the set, just like you would with Lebesgue measure. So we have that uh, finitely additive measures Uh, are in bijective correspondence to uh, states on bounded functions on X. So you have the space of bounded functions uh, and this is a C-star algebra, and then you have states on the C-star algebra. By states, I just mean a continuous linear functional, uh, which gives the constant one function the value one. And it should be a positive linear functional, takes positive things to positive things. So if you start with a finally additive measure, you can integrate just like you do with a Lebesgue measure. You approximate by simple functions, etc., and then you can produce such a state. Conversely, if you have a state, then you can restrict the state to characteristic functions, and that gives you a finally additive measure. So we have this bijective correspondence. Uh, moreover, states on, uh, we also have that L infinity of a set is naturally isomorphic. We can take the Galpon spectrum. This is a uh, an abelian c star algebra. And this is naturally isomorphic to continuous functions on the stone check compactification. In fact, this is my favorite way to define the stone check compactification, and this is how Stone defined the stone check compactification. Um, he defined it as the Galpon spectrum of L infinity of X. Uh, so, and then, well, what do we have? Now we have state states on continuous functions on a compact Hausdorff space. So now we can use the Reese representation theorem. So states on here are in bijective correspondence, this is the Reese representation theorem, with probability measures. Now this is usual notion of probability measures, countably additive probability measures on the stone check connectification. 
So finally, additive measures on X are in bijective correspondence with countably additive probability measures on the stone check compactification of X. Uh, of course, what you give up and passing to in order to get countably additive is you go to this horrendous uh, space here, the stone check compactification. Uh, so this is a horrendous space. Uh, however, it is still a compact Hausdorff space. And so you have all the tools that you've developed from general measure theory that you can apply in this, in this situation right here. Uh, so that's one remark. So another, you could rephrase von Neumann's definition as the existence of an invariant state on L infinity Fx, or you can rephrase it as the existence of an invariant probability measure on the stone check compactification. So these are equivalent definitions. All right, so now, yeah. Does our set X have a topology in principle? Does it no, start? this is just as an abstract, abstract set. Okay. Yeah, everything I'm doing so far is an abstract set. Although, uh, of course, all of these notions, you could define them for you know, topological spaces, stuff like that. But for this discussion, I'm just treating X as an abstract set. Yeah, like the stone check compactification, uh, you can define for any locally compact space that's perfectly well defined, or actually any topological space, you can still define the stone check compactification. Um, that's what I was asking because I guess if you have two different topologies, I'm not sure if the stone check compactification is. Uh, yeah, of course, if you have two different, so the stone check compactification for a topological space, you want to put L infinity here. You would put um, uh, continuous bounded functions. So of course, if you change the topology, you would change the space of continuous bounded functions. Okay. Um, also, uh, the stone check compactive verification is is really more functorial when you restrict yourself to uh, locally compact Hausdorff spaces. So, uh, yeah. Otherwise, the otherwise, so if you have a locally compact Hausdorff space, then your space embeds into the stone check compactification homeomorphically. Uh, if you have a more general space, that may not be the case. All right, so now uh, let's see. So I've given you a definition. Um, let me start with, I think we have just enough time to prove that all abelian groups are amenable. So the first thing to remark is the following example. That is that you have uh, ZD. Uh, this is amenable. Why is this? Uh, you can construct a mean more or less explicitly. Actually, you, you need axiom of choice to, to construct these means, so you can never do it explicitly, but this is about as close as you can get. And that is that uh, this uh, has a, what is called a Fulmer sequence. Uh, so uh, we have this sequence Fn, which is just, uh, there are many possible ones, and here's one example. So we take we take this set uh, right here. So this is a finite subset of uh, ZD, and uh, and then we know a quick observation will tell you that this has the property such that um, if we look at a fn symmetric difference fn. Well, these sets become almost invariant as uh, they become larger and larger. And by that, I mean that if you look at the proportion of points which are mapped outside of the set A, uh, proportionally to the size of the set, this is fairly small. So this goes to zero as n goes to infinity, and this is for all A and CD. Uh, I'll, have, I'll leave it to you guys to verify this fact. This is just kind of an, an observation. So the, maybe the, th the thing to make it easier is that uh, you can check pretty easily that's, that it's enough to check for A, the generators of the group. Because of course, if you had you know, some word here instead, then you could, uh, you could expand this word and, and use some, some properties there. That's no problem. So it's just enough to check to the generators. And then there, what are you doing? You're just shifting this over one, and here you can explicitly calculate this. Uh, so this will, the size of these sets will 
roughly be something like 2n to the d, whereas the size of these sets will roughly be something like uh, 2n to the d minus 1 or something like this. Uh, or um, no, not 2n, the, yeah, maybe something like that. That sounds about right. Uh, so you see that the, the quotient goes to 0 as, as this happens. All right, so this is called a Fulner sequence. Well, what can you do with this? Well, now you define these states on L infinity of ZD, states by, uh, you just define them to be the probability measure corresponding to averaging over this finite set. So phi n of some f, is exactly one over the size of Fn, and then you just sum over um, uh, So this is a perfectly nice state. It takes positive things to positive things. Uh, it's a linear functional, it's continuous, and you see that it's because we divide it by the size of the set n, it takes the constant function to one. So this is a perfectly nice state. Now the next fact we use is we use the fact that state, the state space for any C-star algebra is compact and the weak star topology. Uh, so therefore there's some accumulation point. We let, so that's Banaka Lagalu. Uh, we let phi be some weak star accumulation point. And then what do we notice? Well, we notice that if we look at, so it's in particular a state on L infinity. And if we look at phi of F minus phi of the natural action of T times F, I didn't say what the natural action of, if F is an L infinity. So I should have said that over here. Uh, what do I mean by the action here? So T times a function at x is just defined to be x at t inverse x. We put the inverse there to make sure that this is associative. Uh, okay, so that's what I mean by the natural action on the L infinity space. Uh, so then what do we see? Well, we can just compute uh, this. Uh, so this will be, uh, so this, well, well, let's compute the limit and see what happens there. And when we compute the limit, what's going to happen is we're going to get 1 over Fn. And then we're going to get the sum over T in Zd. Now we have F, oh, I should use T. I should use different letter S. Uh, Fs and then minus F T inverse S. And then you see that there's lots of overlap in this sum. So we have these things and these things, and there's lots of overlap uh, between these two elements here, S and T inverse of S. So specifically, the terms which don't cancel are we're going to have Fn, uh, and then we're going to have the sum over S in, uh, oh, this should be, sorry, this should be Fn here, because we're averaging there. Uh, so we're going to have the things that are in Fn, but are not picked up in the second term, so they're not in uh, I guess t times fn, and that'll be f of s. And then we're going to have minus, and now we're going to have the things that are in, uh, I guess, t times fn, but are not in fn. And we're going to have f, f of s here. I just put absolute values there, there. And now you see here that uh, if the symmetric difference is small, and here we have written out the symmetric difference, so this whole thing is less than or equal to the symmetric difference of Fn with Tfn divided by Fn. And then here we just estimate in the worst possible way, that is that it's just no bigger than the infinity norm of F, F was boundary function. Uh, and then we see that as N goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And that's for each and every T. So what does this say? This says that now if you take any weak star accumulation point, we get therefore phi of f is actually equal to phi of t times f. 
so that this state is actually invariant when you pass to any accumulation point. Uh, so that proves that ZD is amenable. Uh, okay, so I think here is then a good place to stop. Uh, we'll talk about other amenable groups, and in particular, free groups are not amenable. We'll prove that next time, and, uh, and then we'll get on to other approximation properties after Wednesday. Are there any questions before we go? If you have a minute after class, could I uh, talk, like, ask you a few questions about this class, but also a different class? Uh, yes, absolutely. But uh, I have office hours scheduled. They start at four, um, so I'll okay. have to go to my other, my other um, uh, Zoom, my office, my Zoom office. So you can find that on the syllabus, uh, and you might have to compete with undergraduates in intro to analysis. Uh, so we'll see. But if nobody's there, I'm, I'm happy to discuss. If people show up, then you can send me an email and we can find another time. Okay, thanks. Any other, any other questions? All right, great. We should also probably, I think, uh, at some point in the semester, maybe organize um, some sort of informal discussions, may, maybe as maybe in the second half of this semester, uh, because like I said, the point of this class is it should eventually lead into um, current research. And so it'd be nice to get, uh, have, make this more of a conversation at points maybe later in the semester. So we, we can schedule something like that. But I, I think uh, at least for the first half of the semester, uh, we shouldn't worry about that. All right, in that case, it's good to see everybody and I, I will see all of you again on Wednesday.